All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, welcome to week nine, not counting the week that we missed last week. Um, today, we are going to wrap up our discussion of Windows Phone 8 because, of course, we don't have a normal class tomorrow. We have the final projects tomorrow. Not by tomorrow, I mean next week. <laughs> uh, the format for that is going to be that it's going to be in this same room at the same time next week, Monday, uh, June 9th. And uh, you guys will, I will come up with a pseudo-randomized list of presentation orders. And you guys will each spend like um, maybe five to seven minutes. Sorry. Five to seven minutes uh, giving a presentation that will be like a PowerPoint presentation. And a uh, and a uh, live demonstration of your app and everything it can do. So uh, this week we're going to be talking about advanced UI concepts, most specifically something called data binding, which is going to be really useful in Windows Phone applications when you want to do something like take data and display it in a kind of flexible way. And it's the way that the long list selector works, which is the way that you have a list of elements in Windows Phone 8. Something that some students uh, tend to run into wanting to do every now and then, display a list of things. We are also going to take a look at uh, Android and iOS, kind of as a departure from Windows Phone 8, to try and get an idea as to how different these uh, different mobile phone operating systems are, and how what we've learned in this class maps to something like Android or iOS. So let's start with the uh, a little bit of talk about advanced UI. So UI is all about effectively displaying data to the user, right? You have some kind of data inside of your application. You want to display it to the user in a way that makes sense and that is hopefully easy to program. Windows Phone 8 uh, and kind of the Windows Phone series in general condemns what they call Chrome. Chrome is, in this case, not Google's browser, but is instead the idea that you have these fancy graphics on screen that have nothing to do with the data that you are trying to display. They're just things like gradients or, um, or fancy icons that have nothing to do with it, or <laughs> Apple was especially bad about this a couple of years ago, things like having a, uh, a leather-bound book for an address book with you know, uh, little uh, bindings and stuff like that to make it look like an actual book. Windows Phone, on the other hand, says, "All right, we're going to try and um, we're going to try and condense the data down into as minimalist a format as possible, so that there's nothing between the user and the data. So, for instance, if you have a uh, address book app and you want to look at your list of contacts, clicking on the name of the person should take you to the kind of expanded view page, rather than having a little icon next to it that says like more." info or like a little uh, person symbol or something like that. The idea is that the data is the interface, as opposed to having the data alongside an interface. So to try and motivate that in a code sense rather than a design sense, we want to learn about something called data binding. Data binding is where we are able to take our internal data structures. So if we have, say, a list of people we're going to be able to take that and have it kind of automatically translate into user interface elements that have behaviors and, um, and graphical representations. So this gets a little abstract, but hopefully we'll see how it all hooks up pretty easily. So to do bit data binding, we use a special XAML syntax that is called, it's this little binding thing inside of curly braces. And what this means is that this text block will display the value of dc.name, where dc is what I'm using to mean the data context for this text block. Now what that means is I am eventually going to take, in code, I'm going to take a object and assign it as the data context for some XAML element. In this case, I'm going to assign it to the parent of this text block. So on a, if this was just a bare application and all we start out with is the default template, that's that content root grid object that gets automatically generated for you. That I'm sure you've seen a hundred times and have ignored every single time. Data contexts are what serve up data for binding in XAML. Uh, 
So if we assign the data context of that grid, so it's the grid that contains everything in our application, when we assign that data context, that means that all the children get that data context as well, because XAML is hierarchical and it inherits default properties from things higher up in the chain, or higher up in the tree, however you want to look at it. So we can take that data context, assign it an object that has a name parameter, and then when this text block says binding name, that means that it will grab the name parameter, the name field, from that data context object and use that as its text. So we could do something like we've been doing all quarter, where we name this text block and then manually assign to it from c -sharp code. This is a different way of going about that same thing, where instead, going to assign an object as the data context to the XAML region, and then all of its children elements can have these binding statements, and they will kind of automatically go out and grab, um, they'll go out and grab the values of the fields of that object that we just assigned. So let's go ahead and see what it looks like on the code side. The code side, let's say we have a class called test binding, and it's got a name and an address that are strings. And we set that as the data context of the content panel. So here we have content panel.data context equals TB, where TB is this test binding object. Then that would give us the demo that we are about to experience. So if we come over here, we're going to look at data binding test which has just a single XAML file and a single c -sharp file. The XAML file, once we blow it up a little bit, is very, very simple. It has a single text block right here that says binding name, right? And it's just taking up this entire area. In the C-sharp code, we have exactly what we just saw. We have a public class test binding that has a name and an address, and we're going to create test binding, assign the name, assign the address, and tell the content panel, here is your data context TV. And so if we were to run this, we will see that the when we first run this application, it will have a text block that will get the name of that or they get the value of the name, which in this case is, I think, Elias Saba. And the address is completely unused because we don't have a text block that is bound to the address uh, property, only to the name property. So we'll let this guy boot up once at the beginning. While this is booting up, any questions about how this kind of thing fits together? That's a good question. It actually won't refresh without you explicitly telling it to, but explicitly telling it to is kind of the whole point. So we will get to that on the next slide. <clears throat> so we can see here, ta-da, it says Elliot Saba right there. Even though I don't have that hard-coded in the XAML, and I didn't explicitly assign it in the C Sharp. I kind of implicitly assigned it by giving it a data context. And the data context I assigned to this grid. But because the text block doesn't have an overriding data context, it automatically inherits the data context from the next element up, which is grid. So if you have more complex uh, data structures that you want to output, for instance, if you wanted to output not only the text, or not only the name, but also <coughs> the um, address, we could go ahead and open up our toolbox, which, oh, I see I have to stop it first. We can open up our toolbox, grab another text block, and I can't see the, I gotta make it a little bigger so that I can actually drag it onto it. So we'll grab a text block, put it down here, and this guy will have the address stored in it. So the only thing we're going to do is we're going to take away the text, 
or sorry, we want to take the text and we're going to bind it, right? We are going to grab, instead of binding name, we will say binding address. And one of the cool things about this is that we don't have to mess around with types, right? Like normally you would have to make sure like, oh, it's expecting a type of type test binding or it's expecting a type of type uh, contact. But in this case, everything's done dynamically. So we can pass it any kind of object we want, just like we do here. And it'll just look for values that are of type, that have the name name or the name address. The dangerous side of that is that if we ask for something that doesn't exist, let's go ahead and do that right now. So instead of text equals binding address, we'll say binding address two. When we run this, it will just do nothing because there is no address to, so it can't display anything. Luckily for us, it doesn't actually crash. It does throw an exception, but it doesn't crash, which is kind of nice. So we'll get rid of address two, make it just address, run it again, and it says ASDF, because apparently that is my address. All right, let's move forward one step. Let's talk about change notifications. So change notifications are what make this kind of thing actually useful, instead of just manually signing everything in C Sharp. It's a concept that's inherited from Silverlight. So for those of you who haven't run into all the Windows Phone 8 Silverlight kind of ambiguity stuff, Silverlight is a technology that uh, Microsoft developed before Windows Phone 7, and Windows Phone 7 inherited all that stuff as its UI. So that's where XAML comes from. It runs on the desktop, all that good stuff. Um, in order to do change notifications, we have to tell our class that is the data context, so in this case that's the test binding, we have to tell it, hey, you can be changed, and when you're changed, you need to notify whoever is displaying you. And so in order to do that, we create a class that implements an interface. So for those of you who haven't known a lot of object-oriented programming, there's this thing called inheritance, which I'm sure you've heard of before. You have parent classes, you have child classes, etc. Interfaces are just a kind of parent class. And when you inherit from it, or alternatively is called implement it, or subclass it, many different names for roughly the same thing, we declare to the compiler, hey, this superclass, or this, in this uh, interface, has certain methods that it says all of its children must implement. And we will implement all of them, and so then we can be treated as if we were of type superclass, or of type um, interface. So in this case, the interface is called like I notify changed or something like that. We'll be able to see it right over here on the data rebinding test. We say I notify property changed. That is the uh, that is the name of the interface that we are going to implement. So just for future reference, any type or any class type that starts with I usually means it's an interface, which means that it's meant to be inherited from. This colon means we're inheriting from it, just like our main page inherits from phone application page. And the I notify property changed Thing, in order to inherit from it, we have to define certain things inside of our class. So, uh, the end result of doing this inheritance is going to be the visualization of data, where when we change the data, the visualization is automatically updated. And it's only updated when we change our data. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. There's just a little bit of extra work that we have to do when we change our data internally in that class, but it's really not that hard. So this is going to allow us to do things like, um, well, everything that's on that list right there, contacts, map locations, emails, all different kinds of data that you just want to display and update when the data itself updates. And of course, if this was a computer science course, we'd have done this a lot sooner. But uh, we've been desperately trying to avoid dealing with inheritance in detail all this quarter because this is just isn't a computer science class. This is a class about doing cool stuff with the data once we've gotten it out of the cold, hard clutches of the hardware. So we're going to deal with it with explicitly just a little bit today uh, for fun.
So we implement subclass from conform to that I notify property changed interface. The only requirement of this interface is to expose an event, and that event is called property changed, and its type is property changed event handler, because Microsoft loves big names. This event has to be fired every time a property is changed. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Uh, the way it's fired is by calling it like a function, just like every event is, and it takes in two arguments. The pointer to the object that is changing, so in this case it's this, and a property of changed event args that takes in the name as a string here. So for instance, if we change the address of the test binding object, we will pass in new property change event args and then address in quotes. And this notifies anyone that's data bound to this object that it has been modified. And we could make our, uh, we could go back to our test binding object here and say, all right, instead of just being able to say like tb.name equals Elliot Saba, we will make the public string name thing a private string name so that nobody can touch it. And then we will have a set name function and a get name function, right? And when we do that, then inside the setName function, we can add in some custom code that not only sets our internal private string, but instead also calls that notify, notify event change thingamajig. So the reason I'm, I'm talking about this private public stuff is because right here, we have made our test binding class able to be changed, and yet it doesn't notify anybody. We want it to make it so that any time name or address are changed, that notify function gets called. Does that make sense? All right, so the reason we have these weird curly braces get set things afterwards is because we're going to learn how to do that with these things called properties. So properties in object-oriented programming are used to expose data in an object, but expose it in a way that we don't release full control of that, uh, of that data to the outside world. By the outside world, I mean other people using your program. For instance, if we, have, um, if we have phone number in here, we might only want to allow strings that are valid phone numbers to be set into our phone number property. Or if we have name, we don't want like an empty string to be able to be set or we want it to be all uppercase, or we want something, something, something. We can run custom logic every time someone tries to assign to that name thing, and we don't have to do it by having set name functions. We can run custom code anytime someone does something like tv.name equals Elliot Sapper. And so the way we're gonna do that is by using properties. So this code synthesizes get and set functions for the property name. So that's a fancy way of saying that when we do this, it makes default functions for the equal sign for set and default functions for the equal sign on the left-hand side for get. It's functionally equivalent to just saying public string name. But we can change it up a bit. We can say something like public string name and then inside the curly braces get private set. And what this means is Nobody can assign to dot name, but everybody can read from dot name because that setter function is now private. This is a C-sharp uh, syntax thing that <clears throat> you'll see uh, every now and then. Um, and so the real takeaway from this is that when we use the equal sign on a property, it's actually calling a function. Even though it looks just like a variable assignment, it's calling a function. And the function, by default, just takes whatever your, uh, you've got on the right-hand side of the equal sign in the set case and just copies it over to this public string name thing. Yes? Uh, if you say private get and private set, would be different than you said private string name? Uh, no, that's function functionally equivalent. Okay. Yeah. So this is the default. Uh, this is like the default functionality. If you, if you just said get set, this is what it will make. 
and you can write this explicitly and get the exact same functionality just with more typing. Yay, right? So it's got an internal string that's private that only it can touch. And then it creates a property called name, and it says, when you try and get name, just return this underscore name thing. And we try and set name, take the value that's being passed in and set it to underscore name. So here you can see this value thing is a special keyword, which is whatever's on the right-hand side of the equals sign when it starts, or when it gets called. Any questions about this? All right, so the real magic happens when you do something like this. This means whenever someone tries to assign to name, take whatever it passed in, call to upper on it, and then assign it to underscore name. So just like that, we have made it so that anytime someone tries to assign a string to our dot name uh, property, it's going to be converted to uppercase first. To uppercase is a standard uh, function that belongs to all strings which you could do other, th other things as well. You could not assign to, dot, to underscore name if something's not a valid uh, telephone number or if it's not a valid email address or whatever. Or you could call a function called notify change every time someone assigns to underscore name. So what this is going to allow us to do is we still have the ease of treating everything just like it's plain old data, right? We can just say dot name equals Elliot Saba or dot name equals less Atlas, and it'll just work. But behind the scenes, we've got some extra functions that are running to update the data transparently. And of course, we're still converting everything to uppercase because that's fun. So let's take a look at what this looks like. We've got a couple different projects in here. We just took a look at data binding test. Now we're going to take a look at data rebinding test. Unfortunately, everything's called main page.xaml and main page.xaml.cs. So, so I'm just going to close all those. And we'll take a look at the XAML and at the C sharp. So the XAML is pretty much exactly the same. We've got a text block that is bound to binding name, and we've got a button. Now, there's quite a bit more code here, but it's just kind of all spread out, and a lot of it is very repetitive. So let's dig in and see what's going on here. First, we've got our test binding thing again, but this time we're telling it that it's inheriting from I notify property changed. We declare our, our event, the property changed event handler. And we create a helper function called notify changed, just because we're going to do the same thing over and over again in all of our set functions. So we decide to make life easier for ourselves. This just wraps calling the function in an if statement to make sure that it's not null, because until we actually get data bound, we want to be able to set the um, the parameters, even if no one has done anything with this event yet. So that's just a safety measure. So we're going to see that notify changed just takes the string, wraps it in a property changed event args object, and then passes it into property changed. So this is that line that was in the lecture slides, which is how we notify anyone who's data bound to us that we have changed for this particular property. So let's minimize that. Next, we have exactly what we just saw in the lecture slides, where we have a private internal string that actually holds the data and a public, um, a public uh, property that does all the conversion of like to uppercase and notifying change and all that good stuff. And then we have the exact same thing for address. Actually, it looks like address doesn't have a get method. That's kind of bad, so we'll add it in. I'm not actually using address, but for completeness, that should be there. <coughs> All right. Next, we create our own little test binding object. And inside of our constructor, we assign the name Elliot Saba 
We assign an address box, an address which is apparently my campus box, and we assign the data context to content panel just like we saw in the previous uh, demo. Then when we click the button, we're going to say we're going to assign the name blah2 to the name. And notice we don't do anything else to notify the UI that something has changed. We don't explicitly um, change the XAML code or anything like that. This just assigns to our internal data structure. So let's run it and see what happens. That's going to try and run on the device. So we change it to the emulator and try again. <clears throat> so it says Elliot Saba in all caps because we translated to uppercase. Then when we click, click the button, it says blah2 in uppercase. It's like magic, right? This is great because we have completely decoupled the idea of the user interface from the how you use your data structures. We no longer have to have special casing of logic and all that kind of stuff in this function to output to the user interface. It's like we have the, the user interface over here, the whatever code that's controlling stuff over here, and then the data right here. And the data does all the communication with the user interface, and the control code that we have over here just interfaces with the data. This is really nice because it's more modular and it's easier to reason about. This might not be a button handler. This might be a background thread that you have running, and that background thread is listening to a... Um, like a TCP socket, and it gets data in, and it wants to update the UI. So all it does is it updates its internal string buffer, and then bam, it's displayed to the user automatically. That's the kind of stuff that this allows you to do. Now, of course, if you're dealing with multiple threads, you immediately think, aha, I might have to use the dispatcher, so you might want to wrap this kind of stuff in a dispatcher um, uh, begin invoke block. But other than that, it's very, very straightforward and very easy. So yeah, that notify changed thing is that helper function that we defined at the top that just checks to make sure that something's not null, and then it does all the wrapping inside those big uh, item names, or those big type names. So let's use this data banding idea to allow us to use a new XAML type. The XAML type is going to be called long list selector, and this is how you do things like scrolling lists. So like in the people app, or the context app, or the... Um, email app or the RSS reader app, basically all of those guys use this idea, or rather this XAML element. Um, we're going to populate a list with data, and we're going to do it in such a way that we aren't like manually creating XAML elements, manually assigning to those XAML elements, and having everything inside of a scroller. What we're instead going to do is we're going to de define a XAML template. So the template will be the XAML for a single item. So it'll be like if we had a uh, contact information app, it'll be like the name and then the address, maybe one in big text, one in small text. And then we're just going to, after we've defined that XAML, we'll create a list of items, each of which is, has a name and address, and we'll just assign that list to the data context of the parent XAML object. And all of a sudden, boom, we will be able to have a list that's scrollable, you can click on individual elements, all that kind of stuff. So let's dig in. The first thing we do is we create a data template for a long list selector. And you don't have to do it in Blend, but Blend is pretty cool and we haven't even looked at it in this class, so we're going to take a, a brief sojourn into that. We're going to bind the XAML elements in the data template in expectation of a data context. So that means that if we have like two text blocks, one for the name, one for the address, we're still going to do that binding name, binding address thing in expectation that there will be a data context assigned to this guy. Then we're going to create an array of objects to be, down, to be bound to by each data template. And then profit, of course. So, let's take a look at this. We go to the next item in this list. Close these. We will first open the XAML and then the C Sharp. And in the XAML, we will see that inside our content panel, 
there's this grid thing. There's not much to see on this guy, so I'm going to move it over. Inside of the grid, there's this thing called a long list selector. It's got a name, some typical vertical alignment, all that stuff. It has this thing called item template. And here it's got this static resource data template one thing. Now that's not particularly helpful in, in all what it means. If we go to the properties uh, pane here, we see that item template has a little green border around it. And if I click on this, the green border means local resource and it's checked on data template one. Now what is data template one, we ask? Data template one is this chunk of XAML right up here. Now this chunk of XAML says, okay, it's not within any of the grids or anything like that. It's out at the top level and it was automatically generated. So we're not going to type all this ourselves, but we are going to figure out how to pull it apart. We've got this application page dot resources thing. So this is saying, all right, everything within these two tags are just resources. They're not actually going to show up in the page itself. They're going to be used by other things in the page. We're going to start a data template that's named as data template one. Inside this data template, there's a grid and the grid has two text blocks. So the way to visualize this, we can do it a couple different ways. The first way we can do it is we can go to the long list selector, go to the properties, take a look at the item template, and we can say edit resource. And when we do that, our XAML editor changes to what looks like nothingness. And we've got the grid here, text block one, text block two, that have zero hit width and height apparently, which is kind of unfortunate. We may want to make them have more than that. They'll automatically expand when we put in data, but just for visualization purposes, let's give them a width and a height so we can kind of see what this is going to look like. So here's the name, here's the address. Um, this kind of looks like nothing we've seen before, right? Because the phone on the left has disappeared and we just have stuff with a gray background and everything's just bounding boxes. If I were to actually give this thing some text rather than data binding it, I could say like, this is the name. And it would show up there, but because it's gray on gray and it's really tiny, you don't see anything, so that's great. So I'm just going to undo that. And we'll just believe in the power of this to actually look like something useful. In order to get back to seeing the XAML editor like we're used to seeing it, we go to Document Outline, and we can click this little Up button. And that takes us back to the phone application page. So if in case you haven't seen this before, this is the document outline where you can look at all the different elements in their, all their hierarchical glory. All right, so we've created a data template. The data template is a little fragment of XAML that is going to say, for each element that gets added into this long list selector, we are going to create one of these, which is a grid with two text blocks inside. Let's take a look at the code and see how we actually get it to generate that kind of stuff. Inside the code, I'm going to blow this up. We have our test binding thing with notify changed, name, and address. Nothing has changed, so we're going to minimize that. What we do create is an array of test bindings that we call TBs. We're going to, ha we're going to have 10 of them. And then inside of our main page constructor, we will create the first three to be um, particular. So we'll have Elliot Saba, Les Atlas, and Chwetek Patel. And then down at the bottom, we will just auto-generate a bunch of student ones that have just, uh, that just count up. And then finally, we access that list object. So that's the long list selector XAML element that we saw in the XAML code a little while ago. And we assign to not something called data context, but something called item source. Because in this case, we're assigning a collection not a data, not a single object, but a collection of objects. And we want the list to intelligently say, all right, create templates for each of these items and assign their data context to their respective items. So the first one will have a data context set to TBS0. And the next one will have a data context set to TBS1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we switch this over to emulator, run it and we see what this looks like. 
we get a list of things that doesn't look too beautiful, but we can probably fix that up a little bit, and it automatically scrolls like that. Because a long list selector knows you're probably going to have more items in this list than you have vertical view space. So it just automatically adds a scroller for you. So this is super easy. Like, this is how many lines of code? And nothing in here is XAML specific except for this one line. All of this is just the normal data manipulations that you would have to do in order to create a generic array of this stuff in the first place. So nothing about this says anything about XAML. With the possible exception of doing this I notify property change thing in the beginning, but we're not even using that because we're not updating the data at all. Any questions about this stuff? All right. So now the next thing we think of is, well, obviously it would be really easy to uh, do the to, to change this data and have it show up in the um, how it show up in the UI, right? Because we've already got this I notify property change thing, and so if we change something, it should just automatically show up. So let's try and do that. So we are going to take this long list selector, drag it up a bit, and we're going to add a button. And when we click the button, we're going to change the first element to say something else. So here's our little button. When we click it, we are going to take that TBS0 guy, I will assign the name to, because I have delusions of grandeur, Professor Elliot Saba, right? And so, hopefully, when we press the button, which we are going to rename graduate, when we press that, we are going to get the first element to change from saying Elliot Saba to Professor Elliot Saba. So let's see if it works. Since you guys have been in my class for, what, nine, ten weeks now, you probably know that if I say see if it works, that means it's not going to work. But it totally did work. <laughs> That's fun. Let's do something a little more advanced. Let's try and add an element. Uh, no, that will be complicated because we've created a fixed sized array here. So, if we wanted to add an element, instead of creating a fixed sized array, we would create a list, right? You guys have seen this before in uh, homework solutions and stuff where we create a list of items. And then instead of assigning with these, we say like tbs.add, that kind of stuff, right? I'm not going to type it all out here because I actually have another, um, another project that will show this off. But we can change individual elements. The thing that doesn't work is adding elements. And the reason why is actually a little subtle. We have this list.item source equals tbs thing. But the list itself does not implement the I notify property changed um, the I notify property changed interface. So when we change the list rather than the items within them, then the overall long list selector doesn't change. The really short solution to that is you don't use a spare array, you don't use a list. If you want to change stuff, you use something called an observable collection. So this is called surprise, surprise, observable collection. And then you can do the typical, we create a new test binding, we set it up, and then we add it to the list. We create a new test binding, we set it up, we add it to the list. And then when we want to create, when we want to press the button to add a new one, we create a new test binding, we set it up, and then we add it to the list. And every time we add it, this TBS collection type is smart enough to notify anyone who's data bound to it. So the individual elements in your collection are smart enough to notify, and the collection itself is smart enough to notify. So when we run this guy, 
we have only three elements in the list, we click add new, and another one shows up. And so we can keep on clicking add new, add new, add new, add new, and we get many, many students in the class. This wouldn't work if I had just used a plain old list. Let's change this one since it'll be a, a minor modification to this one. If I create this as just a list instead of an observable collection, yep, that's all I need to change. Then when I click add new, nothing happens because the long list selector doesn't know that the collection itself has changed, even though if I change an individual element, it will know. Any questions about this? Yes? Can you also bind the callbacks for buttons? Like you had a button for each person? Yep, absolutely. So the way that would work is you would have a callback in your, uh, like so our test binding thing has these properties of name and address. You can bind behaviors in the XAML elements, like the buttons on click function. You can bind that to a property of this object. So I could have like a, uh, uh, well, what does a what does a button click event look like? So I could have a like button click member of this um, debug dot write string. Oh my gosh, I can't type today. So. I'm going to have a function inside of this um, inside of this type called button click, and I need to include system.diagnostics to get debug. So when I click a button, it's not called right string, is it? What's it called? Help me out here, guys. Right line. There we go. So I'm going to create a function called button click inside of our test binding. And then I believe the way to make this work is if we go into our data template, so we're going to edit our data template here. So this long list selector guy, uh, nope, long list selector properties, we'll go into the item template and we'll say edit resource, just like we did before. And we get this horrible gray screen of nothingness. And we've got a text block up here for the name, a text block down here for the address, and now we're going to add on a button. And the button is right here, it is very skinny, and the button has an event that gets fired for click, right? So I could double click here, and it creates a function here called button click one. And the way that's represented in the XAML is over here, at the end it says click equals button click one. But that's not what we want to do, because we want it to be specific for each individual item that's been added to the long list selector. So here, I'll say binding, uh, I think I called it button underscore click. And I'm pretty sure this will work. Uh, instead of just writing hello, we're actually going to write out uh, the name. Because that's a little fancier. So if this doesn't work, there's some intermediate step that I've missed, but this is in the right spirit of uh, what you will do in order to bind this kind of thing. So that, I don't see the button at all actually. So let's go back and make sure that I have the right project selected. Take a look at the XAML. Save the XAML. Maybe make the button a little bit bigger. We should be able to see that for sure. That's called data template one. We are indeed reading from Data template one. All right, let's try it again. Oh, I need to change back from a list to a observable collection. For one thing. All right, one more time. All right, it doesn't seem to want to show up the button, and I'm not entirely sure why that is, so I will have to figure out 
why it doesn't want to show that up. Oh, you know what? I'm probably screwing up my uh, my main page dot xamls because they're all named main page. Thank you for that. Let's open up the correct main page dot xaml. You know what? It also had non-zero width text boxes, so I think you're absolutely right. Let's try and run that. And it crashes, of course. And the exception it gives me is something incomprehensible. It says, H result e fail has been returned from a call to a com component. That's very helpful. So I will have to get back to you on how exactly to do that because I haven't done that in a while. So uh, it's in the same spirit of that, but uh, there's some little thing that I'm missing. Perhaps it's not just a pure binding thing here. It's something that's called something a little bit different, but I'll get back to you. And I'll post that along with the code. So we can, of course, still do the basic thing where we just add uh, extra text items. And there is a function that you can override in the long list selector to pick up when you actually click on an item, rather than a button inside of an item template. So let's take a quick look at this thing called blend that I talked about a little bit. Because blend is, um, blend is a specialized tool for dealing with XAML. And it's kind of neat, and it's something that you guys should be aware of that actually exists. It comes with Visual Studio. And basically, it's a way to do all this working with um, XAML and templates and uh, sample data and all that kind of stuff a little bit easier. So it's set up uh, almost like, a, <laughs> like an Adobe program, like Photoshop or something. Uh, and it allows you to mess with the XAML in a way that's a little bit friendlier than just uh, plain old Visual Studio. The reason we don't really cover it is because Basically, the only use for it is in creating beautiful user interfaces. And uh, that's not something that we really want to spend a lot of time on in this class. But you guys can feel free to use this to do whatever uh, your heart desires with in terms of XAML. So in here, we can do all sorts of things like we can muck, muck around with the data template. So over here in resources, we can see that we have a hierarchical view of this whole thing, including the data template. So I can open up the data template like this, and I can edit things around like, like that in here. And as I make changes in here, I just have to save it, and it will automatically show up in Visual Studio. It'll say, this has been modified, and I say, yes, reload, and all that good stuff. And it turns red over here. There is actually a way to, inside of Blend, generate uh, sample data for your application to show. Things like, I can say, okay, I want to create a new data store. I'll call it data store. And I want it to be of a type that has a thing called name. And I think this is actually disappearing off the edge of the screen. Address. There should be something off along the right-hand side here that allows me to change the type of these from string to integer or something like that. But I think because my screen is so low resolution, it's getting cut off on the edge, which is a little bit uh, unfortunate. But you can then, uh, you can then tell this, um, this thing to generate like things that look like names, things that look like addresses, things that look like phone numbers and stuff, and it'll create like 10 or 20 of them, and then you can assign it into your application to have like testing data in order to have, make it look good and things like that. But that's kind of complicated, so we won't deal with that very much. So feel free to you know, experiment with this blend thing and look up online because there's a lot of people who use this for all of their user interface needs because it's a specialized tool for it. All right, let's get back to Visual Studio now. <clears throat> 
Are there any last questions about using this long list selector thing and why data binding is useful and how you might end up using it in a real program? By the way, this stuff was all used in that uh, on the phone speech recognition demo that actually didn't work, but uh, did have the list of um, the list of waveforms of audio that you had recorded that I showed off during the machine learning lecture. That was all done with a long list selector with data binding, where for each um, for each sample, and in that case, I did have buttons where you could say like, play this sample, play this sample, play this sample, and it would have like a line graph and a button and a progress bar for each uh, audio sample that had been saved to disk and was being read back in again. Okay, if not, we are going to take a few minute break and then, actually we'll, we'll look at this slide first. So the reason we're gonna look at this slide is because this is actually um, kind of the wrap up of Windows Phone 8 for this class. So um, there are of course things about Windows Phone 8 that we haven't covered in this class because it's a huge platform and there's a lot you can do with it. Um, but the good news is that going from week one all the way to here has covered an awful lot of ground. And you may be in the middle of your projects right now, very frustrated with them and unable to see it, but everyone has made some pretty incredible progress in going from not, you know, not really understanding how we're going to possibly get C-sharp and C++ working together, not understanding this XAML thing, to you guys have now created some pretty functional and impressive applications just from the homeworks. I can't wait to see what you guys demo to me next week. Um, the one thing that you should really walk away from this class from is the <coughs> method of learning how these systems work. And this is really going to be uh, compounded when we see all the similarities between what we've learned in Windows Phone 8 and what we'll see in Android and iOS after the break. So all these platforms are pretty moving targets. Like just between last year and this year, we've seen some changes in how Windows Phone works, like the difference between Windows Phone 8 and Windows Phone 8.1. There are some subtle differences that will break code moving from one to the other. You have to go in and change a couple names, change a couple things, that kind of stuff. With Android, they, uh, things change even faster. The code that I had written for the Android sample that we're going to look at after the break last year we are now two generations farther along in Android code bases. So the recommended way of doing things move from recommended to deprecated and then move from deprecated to just doesn't work in the last year. So the binaries will still run on the phone, but the source code doesn't compile properly anymore. So that's kind of how quickly some of these things move is you have to kind of get yourself up to speed very, very quickly. And the connection is bugging out. Uh, I guess there's a reason this adapter was left in the room. There we go. So the main takeaway is once you've learned these concepts and how to do these kinds of things, going from one platform version to another or from one completely op different operating system to another is often just an exercise in learning the new syntax and learning a few extra concepts that they've come up with. But the majority of the concepts are all the same across all the different platforms. So learning to learn these kinds of things and learning how to read the developer documentation, all that kind of stuff, is a really valuable skill. So if that's the only thing that you guys take away from this class, I'll be happy. Because being able to read MSDN documentation means you're already going to understand how to read, say, the Apple developer documentation, or the, um, it's not Sun anymore, it's Oracle Java documentation, that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and take a break, and then we will come back and look at Android and iOS.